Transformative Principle, episode 110 with Frederick Lane. I'm really excited to have Fred Lane on the podcast today. He is a author and wrote a book called Cybertraps for Educators. And after a recent Alaska Ed chat with uh, Tammy Morris and Nathan Adams, we continued the conversation about using digital tools in relationship with students and with parents and, and what's right and what's wrong and couldn't really come to a good uh, understanding with each other. So we thought we'd uh, have Frederick Lane on the podcast and he's going to give some insight into what kinds of things we can and should be doing as educators. This is a really great interview. I hope that you enjoy it. I learned a ton from it as I've learned from all of these interviews that I do and so I'm a little bit selfish in that, but I do want to share that with you. And if you'd like to learn the top five things that I've learned from this, uh, sign up for the newsletter at transformativeprincipal.org, and I'll send you the top five ways I've learned to be a transformative principal from doing these interviews. Thank you so much. Here's the interview. Welcome to Transformative Principal. I'm your host, Jethro Jones, and today I'm very excited to have Frederick Lane on the show Frederick Lane is an author, attorney, educational consultant, and lecturer based in Brooklyn, New York. He is a nationally recognized expert in the areas of cyber safety, digital misconduct, personal privacy, and other topics at the intersection of law, technology, and society. Lane has appeared on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, the BBC, and MSNBC. He has written eight books, including most recently, Cyber Traps for Educators. All of his books are available on Amazon.com or through his website, FrederickLane.com. And I'm very honored to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much, Fred, for being here. It's a pleasure, Jethro. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm really excited because this is a topic that not a lot of people talk about, but frankly, we as educators are all scared to death of falling into a cyber trap. Can you talk about what a cyber trap is first? Absolutely. I think that's a great place to start. My working definition of a cyber trap is a legal or personal situation or problem that arises because of or is facilitated by the use of d digital devices or social media or some other form of electronic communication. So many of what I refer to as cyber traps are problems that people have dealt with for many, many years. But a lot of the concerns that I discuss arise because electronics makes it so much easier. So many of us have talked about the pace at which life occurs. I think that that's one of the main contributing factors to what I consider to be cyber traps, that we have lost the time for reflection and thoughtfulness and care. And so people need to be more aware and more alert now uh, than they might have had to have been a few years ago. Yeah, it's powerful what you said that these things have existed for a long time and technology makes them so much easier. Just the other day, you wrote a blog post uh, reviewing a book, which I forgot the title already. <laughs> well, then I didn't do a great job. The, <laughs> the book's title is um, Invisible Target by Andrea Clements. Invisible Target, that's right. And you talked about how this uh, the story that she shares about her issue of uh, sexual abuse and grooming by an educator was done in a very old school way. And so these things have happened and you ended that blog post saying that we don't really know if things are happening more because we don't really have a good documentation of all that. But it sure seems like it based on the things we hear and the way technology has increased. What are your thoughts about how much easier it is now to get in trouble? Well, I think you raise a really good point and that And that's a great thing to discuss here because one of the first concerns that I began identifying when I was researching in this area is the fact that we don't have a good clearinghouse for information across the country about even the level of educator misconduct, let alone how it happens, what kinds of techniques, what kinds of software, you know, what kinds of circumstances lead to these kinds of boundary violations. So that's, that's an enormous problem that I think, you know, legislators and regulators and, and really the school community needs to look at. And I understand the resistance, and I'm sure you do too as a, as a principal, 
because people want to protect the identity of the schools, they want to protect the identity of kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are a lot of reasons to limit the spread of information, but at the same time, it makes it very difficult for us to better understand how frequent these issues are and how they arise and what we should be doing uh, from a policy perspective. Now, on the other side of that, as you reference, I, I close the blog post with a discussion of the impact of technology on these kinds of situations. So what Andrea was describing in her book, which by the way is a very uh, difficult read to put it mildly, but what she was describing is a situation where a teacher was paying special attention to a student who felt isolated, uh, felt unloved at home, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't need technology to do that, obviously. It, you know, we know of many, many circumstances in which those kinds of situations arose well before cell phones. My point, though, is that with cell phones, we've transitioned to a time when every kid who is carrying a cell phone has their own individualized phone number. So now they can be contacted directly at all hours of the night. If a kid is texting from his bedroom at 10, 30, or 11 at night and happens to have the teacher's cell phone number and you know maybe just wants to know what the homework is, nonetheless, you've got a communication that's going directly from the student's bedroom to the teacher's bedroom. And even if the contents of the conversation are completely innocuous, there's an implicit breaking down of barriers there that I strongly believe contributes to what we refer to as the slippery slope of misconduct. You know, because then people are tired, it's late at night, they start chatting about things that are non-educationally related, and then the conversations all too often get personal. And then they segue into much more dangerous waters. Yeah. And what are some of the most common types of thing, boundary violations or cyber traps that educators fall into? Well, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a wide range of them. And I will throw out a plug for, for my book, Cyber Traps for Educators, because I run down a, a range of potential problems. But I would say the most common, let's pick three off the top of our head. Number one is productivity within the school environment. We have these devices, they attract tremendous amounts of her attention. Anybody who's worked with teenage kids knows how compelling devices are. And adults are not that much uh, more resistant in many ways. So you've got a real issue within the school environment. Are teachers as focused on their students as they should be? You know, I've got some great examples in the book of people who are doing, you know, March Madness betting pools or surfing inappropriate websites. Sometimes their, their productivity problems are caused by sending harassing emails to their coworkers. It's all of the normal interrelationship stuff that exists. It's just that, again, technology makes it much easier. So there's that. I think another significant cyber trap that people run into, particularly educators, is oversharing of personal information. Um, and again, we're getting back to this concept of boundaries, but also the idea of being a role model within the community. And it is unquestionable that teachers have uh, this expectation placed upon them by the parents, by the school board, what have you. And it's just part of the job. It's, it, it's part of what makes teaching such a difficult thing because you've got this responsibility to set a good example for the students. Social media makes that so much more difficult because even again, if you're sharing absolutely appropriate photos, putting aside, you know, the less polite examples, you're still sharing aspects of your life that are private, that should not necessarily be shared with your students because it at the very least distracts from your ability to teach, but then also runs the risk of reducing respect not that I'm a huge authoritarian, but but that there is a role for a sense of authority, a sense of respect within the classroom. So there's that. The one that we sort of led with in this show is by far the most serious, and that's the use of social media to start and then engage in an inappropriate relationship or actually more accurately sexually assault a student. And 
the issue that you run into when you read more and more of these cases is that social media creates a false sense both of intimacy and, uh, for lack of a better term, pureness. The digital technology has a leveling effect on the natural distance between a teacher and a student. You know, a good example of that, Jethro, would be that, you know, students today have access to unbelievable amounts of information from their desk. They can sit there with a smartphone if they're hooked into Wi-Fi or, or the cellular network, and they have the world's information at their fingertips. And it used to be that, by definition, the teacher was more informed and had a greater pool of knowledge than the students. But now students, of course, feel like, hey, you know, we know, quote unquote, as much as the teacher does because we can just look it up on Wikipedia. Now, that's appalling in and of itself, but there's that perception. And it plays out in this false sense of emotional equivalence as well, that kids appear to be more sophisticated today. They're certainly more sexually aware than they have been in the past. And so there's a leveling or an apparent leveling between adults and children thanks to technology. And that, again, makes all of this much more perilous for people who are working around kids all the time. And it's a real challenge. Yeah. And to me, the the frustrating part about this all is that I really want my teachers to have a relationship with my students, obviously one that is appropriate, but if they have a relationship, so much more good things can happen because of that than if they don't. And having a relationship is an important part of teaching and learning together. And the frustrating thing to me is that it's so easy to step over that line and you always have to have those boundaries in place and kids don't understand what those boundaries are. And so it's even more pressure on teachers to know where that line is and where to stop. And for me as a principal coach of my teachers, that's what's so hard. It's a very difficult Jethro. And I think you put your finger exactly on it. Look, I, I come from a family of teachers. I'm, I'm not one myself. I, I did the school board and said, and I've had a couple of my relatives say, you know, I, can't, I really can't read your blog anymore. It's too discouraging to me because, you know, all of the teachers I know are, are great people. Yeah. And I, I can totally respect that. I understand, you know, look, as a parent, right, I have four boys and you, you need a relationship to be able to help guide them. I completely agree with that. And I would not want a situation where our schools are more robotic, right? And, and less humane and, and less human. And, and they're not likely to be. I mean, that's just the, you know, that's just human nature. But social media and digital technology change all of that. And it was one thing 25 years ago when none of this stuff existed for teachers to maintain polite, respectful, even friendly relationships with students because there wasn't access to information about the teachers or, frankly, the other way, about what the students are doing that there is today. And that's the big thing. We talk about the increase in information and knowledge. If we're talking about academic information and knowledge, that's one thing. That's, that's a tremendous upside to the Internet. But if we're talking about access to personal information, you know, which taps into all of the privacy work I've done, then that's much more problematic because that personal information is not helpful in the educational context. It actually creates, it, it facilitates this idea of, of intimacy between students and teachers that creates more risks than provides benefits. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I've never thought about it like that before. And I see now where, where that personal information actually damages the relationship. I feel very strongly about that particular point, Jethro. And I, I, I think that it is a nice way to solve the problem, the dilemma that you posed, right? Because you can then coach your teachers by saying to them, look, on a face-to-face -face level, you're obviously, you know, you're a human being. You, you will do a better job of the, as, as a teacher if you're, if you're empathetic to your students, if they feel like they have a connection with you. But that's the limit to that 
role. You don't need to share information with your students in order to be empathetic in a face-to-face -face situation. So I think helping them to understand that distinction and to have them step back a little bit with respect to social media. Now, let me be clear, absolutely the same message needs to be given to the students, right? Because you know, they have a responsibility. And, and this is one of my hobby horses too, honestly, is that we, we need parents to spend more time thinking about the fact that increasingly they're giving middle school students global publishing platforms. Every kid who is carrying around a smartphone, and it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not much of one, is the functional equivalent of CNN, right? This happened when I was on the school board in, in Burlington, Vermont. We had a fight outside of the school cafeteria. School resource officer goes bombing outside, breaks up the fight, and we discovered later that by the time he got out there, there were three versions of that fight on YouTube. It was it was that fast and that easy. The kids are sitting there recording like Geraldo Rivera. Boom, that stuff's up on the web. So, you know, for parents to be giving kids these smartphones, putting aside all of the, the terrible stories of kids actually being assaulted, simply the kids' ability to capture and distribute information changes the game. And as you know from reading my blog, there are plenty of teachers, and in some cases it's useful, the teachers have been caught doing bad things. But then kids also use this digital technology to goad teachers, you know, to engage in what's called cyber baiting, where some kid pushes the teacher's button and you've got an accomplice on the other side of the room filming the whole thing. So while I think teachers, as the adults in the classroom, have the primary responsibility to mediate their relationship with the students, there's a huge responsibility on the part of parents and to a lesser degree, the school, to start educating kids literally from kindergarten on up about what is appropriate use of digital technology. And you know, whether you call it digital citizenship or digital ethics, it's a way of approaching the world that I think we need to really focus on. Yeah, I totally agree. We do a, a thing called Silver Ribbon Week, which is basically that instructing students about technology and, and how to use it appropriately. And that's not enough. It, it needs to be constant and almost daily. And the issues that we run into with students inappropriately using their cell phones to, to bully others or to do whatever really does underscore the fact that they need to be taught appropriate use because they get this powerful device and then they don't know how to use it and how to be appropriate with it. It's, it's a little bit difficult to imagine how you would implement this, but I am slowly coming around to the idea that, you know, smartphones need a learner, learner's permit. You know, <laughs> you need to have maybe even a, a, an operator's license for a smartphone because, you know, these devices are so ubiquitous that collectively, you know, the, the potential harm that they cause exceeds automobiles, right? And we're giving these devices to kids who can't even see above a, a dashboard. So, you know, it's it's not directly analogous. But, but I, I think parents really should think about smartphones in that context, you know, that, that these are the equivalent of high-powered woodworking tools or sharp kitchen knives or any number of things where without proper training, there's a real potential for harm. And we are in a situation, I, I, you know, I've talked about this, that, you know, Steve Jobs and his crew created an operating system, the mobile OS, that was designed to make it easier for older people, honestly, people in my demographic, right? You wanted this device to be super simple and adaptable and inadvertently they created an, an operating system that two-year-olds can use yes and so the kids gravitate to these things and their their minds are so plastic and so adaptable that they quickly become seemingly experts in the using of the devices well actually maybe that's the correct way to put it they're experts in the operation but not the appropriate use. And there's two different things there. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm sure everybody has stories of their kids figuring out their passcode before they know what numbers are. 
<laughs> right. And how much, how much, you know, effort does it take to, you know, put mom's credit card into the, you know, Apple payments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no good. So while we're on that subject of generational differences, do you think that this is something that the future generations maybe won't find irrelevant, but will find uh, just, uh, they'll have a different approach. So my kids are four or five, eight and nine right now, and they're all growing up having an iPhone in the house and they, they know how to use it. They know what it does. They're exposed to things more than, than I ever was. You know, my mom's response when I asked like, what does something inappropriate mean? She would say, go look it up in the dictionary. I am not going to tell my kids to do that. (laughs) Because there's Google. Google it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, not going to happen. So do you think that like my kids, And their relationship with their kids and technology will different. Of course, it'll be different. But do you think they'll say that's not a big deal? We know how to how to deal with this stuff and we have better plans in place. And our generation is just caught off guard, not knowing how to deal with any of this. That's that's a fun question, Jethro. I don't think there's any question that that our generation and, you know, I obviously don't know your age, but it sounds like you're a little bit behind me. But I think our generation was absolutely blindsided by the invention of cell phones and then social media. You know, when you look at the fact that, you know, really for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, smartphones have been around for nine years, that's, that's a ridiculously short period of time when you consider the social changes that we've experienced. So I'm going to claim credit for our generation as being the most blindsided by technology. I think that we are going to develop better mechanisms and better curricula for helping people integrate technology into their lives. The flip side of that, though, is that a constant with respect to technology is the speed of the increase in the speed of change. And I think that, that your kids and, and my kids are you know, basically a decade ahead of yours, or a little bit more. Our kids collectively are going to be faced with technologies that we can't even imagine. You know, just pulling from the headlines when you start looking at the development of virtual reality, when you look at autonomous vehicles, when you look at robots, you look at the, the smart, the Internet of Things, right, the smart grid, all of those things will have a cumulative effect and a social impact that, as I said, is is really pretty unimaginable. So they're going to have their own challenges, and they'll be faced with new social conventions and, and threats to deal with. What I'm hoping, though, is that this period of time, and, and this is part of the work that I'm trying to do, will help us to develop ways of thinking about this so that we can fold new technology into appropriate social behaviors. That's optimistic, I guess. I don't think that the technology looking forward will be so transformative, but everybody, everybody's wrong about technology, basically. (laughs) Yeah, let's go ahead and say you're wrong about that. It will be more transformative. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's fair, and I, I won't be around to argue the point, which is totally fine. But, you know, the thing is that, you know, Every, well, for starters, every generation of parents has their own challenges, so I don't, that's a constant. I think that the, the more interesting issue that you're getting at, and we were talking about this last night during the Democratic Forum, is you know, will future millennial presidential candidates, right? The millennials are in their early 30s, so none of them are up for president yet. But let's fast forward 20 years. Those millennials are going to have social media digital trails, if you will, we, nobody, will be, nobody will be doing paper trails anymore, but they'll have digital trails, which will make for some very interesting campaign ads. And so will there be a normalizing of this kind of public display? That's a great question. You know, what about some senator, male or female, who was caught up in a sexting scandal? You know, is, is it going to be a scandal or is it just going to be, oh, yeah, I was whatever, of course, you know, with digital photography, you can't say you didn't inhale, but, you know, people get past these things. So, yes, I do think that some of the social mores issues will change and behaviors that we find, you know, outrageous or even dangerous today will seem much less so. 
but that's not to say that there won't be new challenges. Yeah, absolutely. You know, your I didn't inhale comment. It it shows what I've experienced that it was bad for a presidential candidate to have that in the past. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that President Obama was very forthcoming about his use of marijuana when he was younger. And it's, yes, he was. Yeah. It, you know, now like nobody's talking about that. And now marijuana is legalized in many states, including Alaska, where I'm at. And so what is, is that going to even be an issue in the next presidential election? And I haven't heard it yet, but, you know, I, part of it is, you know, when you look <laughs> Maybe Martin O'Malley might think on the Democratic side, but it's sort of hard to imagine Hillary or uh, Bernie Sanders. But, you know, who knows? I, I do think that that our attitudes towards these things change. And so that's all well and true. I, I, I think that the more important issue, though, Jethro, and certainly for you on a day-to-day basis, is not so much what people are doing with social media on their own time, but how that is affecting their work life. And even beyond that, are they in some ways using digital technology or social media to cross lines that are not just merely inappropriate, but are actually criminal? And and that's the concern. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, let's let's change the conversation to some um, precautions that we can take as educators. And let's start first about using personal devices and contacting students and parents, which I do want to emphasize are two different things. Contacting parents is different than contacting students. Let's talk about some precautions we can take to to not fall into a trap with that. So that was a really great discussion with Frederick Lane, and we're going to continue the conversation next week. And next week, we're going to talk about the ways teachers can avoid uh, cyber traps and things you can do to help them. Thank you so much for listening to this show. It means a lot to me that you listen to it. Please share this with your friends, with your colleague principals. I think this topic, especially for those of us that are older, I don't know a better way to say it, but those of us that are older that need to understand how to use these uh, digital tools effectively. It's a very important conversation for us to have. So please share it. Leave some comments on the website, transformativeprincipal.org. And uh, I'd love to have Fred Lane on again. So if you uh, have questions, make sure you let me know and I'll, I'll get him back on the show again in the near future. This podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Go to edupodcast.com network.com.